I'm going to be talking about, so I'm assuming everyone has heard of microservices. I hope, no, have not, okay. <laughs> um, well, I put it in the slide thinking if people had heard of microservices, <laughs> some of this stuff might, uh, the title of the slide might resonate a little bit. Um, so we, we've been talking for the last couple of years, two, three years now about microservices and breaking our applications, our monoliths down into smaller pieces so that we can go faster and um, get, reduce the time to value when we make changes to our applications so that our, our teams can scale, our, our applications can scale. But I, what I've been seeing along those couple of years is uh, when people do go try to break down their applications, they very quickly realize that the application code, there's, there's definitely complexities in the application code, but once you get down to where the data for that application lives in the myriad of different types of data storage, database type technologies, breaking the application down at that level becomes kind of painful and kind of difficult and raises a lot of red flags. What do you do when your application is nicely talking to this, this, this database that has all the tables and is able to do all kinds of complex joins and queries and all this stuff and transactions and so on. And now you're talking about breaking your application down into small services and that each service owns its own data and owns its own database. Um, so we're gonna, in this talk, we're going to look at some of the challenges of, around data and some of the challenges that come up when you do try to go and, and break down your applications and, you're, and, you're, and you uh, are confronted with possible solutions. Um, so let's, let's get going. This is an abbreviated version of the slide deck. And this slide deck, you can get the full slide deck here. It's something that I'm constantly updating also. So even if you've seen it once in the past, I'm constantly adding more, more uh, content to it. And this is, this is the, the version of the talk that'll fit in about 50 minutes or so. But if you want the full, the full slide deck, then uh, feel free to go there. I'll introduce myself. My name is Christian, Christian Post. I'm a principal architect at Red Hat. I travel all over North America meeting with our enterprise customers. And, and I've been helping them build large, complex, distributed systems to solve some of these uh, business problems that they have. I recently wrote a book, well, I guess recent, in, in June, uh, called Microservices for Java Developers. And the book just is, is absolutely a hands-on, step-by-step introduction to using Java frameworks to start to build microservices and deploy those onto technology like Docker and Kubernetes. So things like Spring Boot and Wildfly Swarm and Drop Wizard. I, uh, in the next slide, no. So if you go to developers.redhead.com, you can get a free copy. But I actually have some hard copies here, uh, a couple different books related to microservices and related to data. I uh, have about 11 or so. If you go to the Red Hat booth at the Expo Hall, then we have, we have a lot more. Feel free to pick up a copy. And I'll hand these out to people who ask questions at the end. You can pick which one you have. I only have four of the, the database one and, and seven of mine. But I, 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 when I meet with these customers, I, draw, I, I try to draw on the experience that I had working at Zappos.com and their parent company, you may have heard of Amazon. And at this time, back in 2012, I went to start working with their integration teams um, and their services teams. And I was really excited to work with Zappos and, and Amazon. Amazon at the time was the the, you know, the, the vanguard of SOA. And at the time and before, SOA was the, the, new, was the hype's uh, hotness. And when I went to work there, I, when I first started there, I, I thought, oh my god, when I saw their architecture, I was like, this, this is not SOA. This looks like a huge mess. This doesn't make any sense. This, doesn't, this is not what the Thomas Earl books taught us about SOA. This is not right. Um, and all of their developer tooling and the way they de did deployments, it seemed kind of cool, but it was all closed source proprietary stuff. I didn't really, uh, I wasn't as interested in that. It wasn't open source. Um, but a lot of the things uh, that, I, that I learned and the principles that, that I saw 
I look back and I realize, well, all of that stuff is exact. So when Netflix talks about microservices and LinkedIn and Twitter and all these people, that's exactly what Amazon was doing. And now Amazon, of course, you know, let's change the name to from SOA to microservices. Amazon is one of those uh, those internet unicorns as well. But so what I do is I try to draw on that experience that I that I had at Amazon and help enterprise our enterprise customers understand and realize what microservices might mean to them. Because it, what it looks like at Amazon or Netflix doesn't mean it's going to look like that at your companies or at the enterprise companies that I, that I work with. Um, and trying to understand, help them understand the path, the journey that they need to go down to get to that, the, the, the state, you know, that, that state where they're going faster and they're uh, doing more builds and they're able to experiment and learn. Um, that's, that's the goal, not doing microservices or SOA or, or whatever the, the current buzz is. So I'm going to be talking about how we take our applications and what are some strategies that we can use to confront some of the problems that we'll deal with with data. And when we talk about microservices, Adrian Cockroft said this perfectly, and, and I use this on all my slides, that we can't just start breaking up applications, start using Netflix OSS, and then say, voila, we're doing microservices. Now we're, now we're much better. Um, it's a, it's a, a journey, and it, it, it crosses technological boundaries, organizational boundaries, cultural boundaries, process boundaries, all of the things that we kind of, as developers, we, we, the technology is awesome. We love the technology. We love learning new stuff, distributed systems. Um, but the hard parts are, you know, we'll talk about the hard parts with related, related to technology, but um, the, the process of, of getting there is more important, not, not the technology that you use. And when we talk about uh, microservices, we're talking about optimizing IT, we're talking about optimizing the business for speed. And this is quite a bit different from how IT operated in the past. IT was seen as the, you know, how do we support business functions? How do we do things like set up email servers and automate human tasks and uh, automate away paper tasks? And um, what, what we're talking about with microservices is optimizing uh, to be able to make changes to our system, our, our, uh, our technology systems much faster and deliver value through technology, which is totally different than we used to look at it. Technology, I'm sure you've seen slides where software is eating the world and everyone's a software company now and all that. Um, so Microsoft is opti about optimizing for speed. But how does a potentially 100-year-old company um, and, and all the legacy that comes with it, how do they go fast? And not every part of the organization has to go this fast. But whether it's your organization, whether it's technology, if you look at a piece of code, how do you end up making it go faster and, and optimize it for that uh, for speed is, is different than um, optimizing it for other concerns like cost, like we did for traditional IT. But it does come down to managing, or in some cases, isolating and reducing some of the dependencies that we have between the components in the system. The more dependencies that we have, the harder it's going to be to make changes and go fast, which is the goal. Um, and there are a lot of different types of dependencies from, um, we can look at the, at the service level, serv services talking to each other. We can look at the team level. If I want to make a change to uh, my, my UI or something, then I kind of have to change the back end services as well. And that might cascade down into changes to the database. Um, and so now I have to file Jira tickets, tickets and coordinate with a bunch of other teams. So there's dependencies at that level. And on and on and on, but I think data is, is one of those major dependencies. But before we can talk about what, you know, what sort of dependency that is or how do we break that dependency or how do we alleviate the dependency, I think we should first talk about, well, what, what is data? What is data? We're, we gotta start somewhere. So what is data? And the best definition I've heard is from William Kent in a book called Data and Reality, um, where I think in the first couple paragraphs he explains that data is, is so like when, when we talk to each other and we explain concepts to each other and we use you know, books and um, computers and laptops and we talk to each other, have a conversation, we're able to in real time figure out any discrepancies or ambiguities um, in, in, in real time. But when we, when we uh, talk about data, what we're talking about is a human trying to encapsulate an idea and explain it to another human 
just like we do in natural language, but we're doing it by putting it into the computer first. We're telling the computer what this concept is. And we're, if, if we explain it right, then we're hoping that the human on the other end who reads this data, does something with this data in the computer, will be able to understand it and make sense of it. And that, that, sounds, that sounds so trivial, but it's, and I'm gonna use a very trivial, trivial example, but it's far more, it ends up being far more complicated. So what is one thing? How do you describe one potentially physical object or one thing? In this case, a book, so I wrote a book, but how would you describe that in a data system that maybe is a uh, online, online bookstore or a bibliographic database? Would you, ha would you have one entry per author, one entry per title? Um, you know, I have about seven copies of my book, seven books up here, is, are each one of those things a book? Um, some books get so big that you have to break them down into smaller pieces and smaller volumes. Are all of those things the book or is it just one physical thing? Does a book have hardcover, softcover, newspapers are not, might not be considered books, uh, and so on. And so just this one simple concept, how do we describe that to another person and write that down in the, in the computer in some sort of form uh, is not very straight, as straightforward as, you, as one would think. Now, you take that and you explode that out to what we deal with in our enterprises and accounts and customers and claims and all, all the different uh, uh, concepts that we try to model in our, in our business software, and this becomes far more complicated. If we take the book example to another step, we could, I don't know how, how clear the text is, but you can see that uh, in certain contexts, in certain, in certain uh, conversations that you might have about a book, for example, buying a book, checking out a book. Each individual physical copy actually is a big deal. We need to keep track and think of a book as in an individual copy because that's how we charge and make money. But if we're doing things like uh, building a search engine, we might not care about every individual copy. We might just care about the titles. Uh, if we're doing a recommendation engine, we might not care about any of that stuff. We might just care about metadata that is related to the book or is it relates other books. Uh, so how we capture this and how we describe this in the computer is going to be different depending on the conversation we're having. And there's an amazing set of patterns and practices from the domain-driven design community mm -hmm. that helps us model these differences and be very specific about these differences across these different conversations that we're having about our domain. Um, domain-driven design is not new. That's, you know, Eric Evans' book has been out. Uh, what was that, 2002, 2003? And the study of data and data systems, information systems goes back way farther than that. Um, and I've had people ask me, well, you're, okay, so we can go through domain-driven design that helps us uh, identify models, that helps us identify boundaries and put, uh, put context around those boundaries. And if you start to squint, that starts to go down the path of, oh, yeah, we want to break up our systems into microservices. Well, this, this boundary-driven, this context-driven approach helps. But I've had people ask, well, Netflix never mentions domain-driven design. LinkedIn doesn't mention domain-driven design. Why, why, why are you talking about domain-driven design? Um, and I think the, the answer is those companies had to solve uh, very difficult problems at, at, at a scale that a lot of enterprises don't see with the number of users, the amount of data they had, what they were collecting. Um, writing a tweet on Twitter is, is, pretty, is pretty easy, but if you have 500 million followers or some gigantic number of follow followers, it's very, technically, it's a very complex problem to solve. Now, in the, if, you, if you shift away from maybe some of the internet unicorn companies that have built microservices and scaled out and did all this and don't talk about domain-driven design, and you look at our enterprises, you start to notice there's a, there's a, there's a very, very clear um, you know, comparison or juxtaposition of how complex, for example, Twitter is, the domain in Twitter, and how complex our financial services companies are, or our insurance companies, uh, healthcare companies that are far more complex. Writing a tweet to Twitter or updating a LinkedIn profile is pretty simple. Displaying it and aggregating and doing all that stuff behind the scenes is is technically challenging. But in the enterprise, we're going to have to deal with both. We're going to have to deal with complexity in the domain. How do we solve that? And we're going to have to deal with complexity at some scale. Maybe not Amazon scale, but some, definitely some scale. Um, 
So, you, okay, so we start going down the path of, uh, of domain-driven design, and we, we use the concepts from, uh, from the literature, bounded contexts, and building aggregates, and um, you know, domain models, and all that, all that really good stuff. And if we're lucky, what we end up doing is we build our applications, and we sort of try to elicit those models in our application, right? And we put them a, a, under uh, or on top of a, a, a database, and we, we're able to get by and do actually pretty amazing things. Think about some of your companies for, that are not doing microservices. They're probably making tons and tons of money. They're doing fine. Um, but how do they get to that next level? Um, well, we have to kind of stop and think, well, wait, doing this has some pretty pretty astounding advantages. Normalizing, so if we go a little deeper, and so when we, uh, when we take our domain models and we actually synthesize those in a database, normalization and SQL querying is actually incredibly powerful. It allows developers to norm normalize the data, whatever, store the data in, in one format, and then do some pretty powerful querying on top of it. Queries that you probably didn't know ahead of time that you were going to write or going to need, but you're able to do this because of, of the way we're storing the data. Um, if, we, if we move away from that, I don't know if anybody using like NoSQL stores like a Cassandra or MongoDB or so, so some of those, and I wonder if, if you've run into this, but when you start using different types of technologies for that, you have to know your queries ahead of time. You have to plan, you have to do the query planning ahead of time. Um, so this, um, this is quite amazing flexibility that we have. Other things like the ACID properties, I'm sure people have heard of, of ACID, uh, atomicity, so it, it allows developers to not have to worry uh, about what happens when things fail, partial failures, it's a, it's a, it's a really nice abstraction. Uh, durability, when things get written to, to a database, they uh, ideally don't get lost. Isolation, make the developer think that they have access to the full database and everything will appear in a nice sequential order. Um, consistency is, is kind of an overloaded word, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But it's not the same consistency that's in the CAP theorem. Um, and it's not necessarily something that the database itself provides. Um, so C is kind of like, acid, acid is very comfortable for developers. C is, the, is comfort. Uh, you, you feel good when you're using this stuff, and you abstract it away from some of the very nasty things that the, the database community has solved for you uh, over the last 40 years. So, my recommendation is to stick with these conveniences, stick with these safety guarantees for as long as you can, because after that, things get pretty nasty. So, all right, well, okay, we'll stick with it as long as we can, but we still end up running into some of these, some of these issues, right, where maybe not all the data will fit in a single database, and we need to scale out the database. Maybe there's... Um, you know, the, the joins and the querying that we're doing is getting, getting way too complicated and we need to look at how do we maybe denormalize the data. Um, and maybe we want to reduce dependencies between teams and, and the uh, teams so that they can work on the different pieces of the system independently and, and move at their own cadence. But we have to, we have to very clearly in, in our minds know that what we're saying to ourselves and to our uh, the, the, you know, the infrastructure folks and the operations folks that, hey, we, we developers, we know that there's been 40, 50 years of da uh, database uh, research and, and uh, theory and implementation and has been around for a long time, but we developers, we got it from here. We'll take it from here and we're going to build microservices and uh, this is what we're going to build and everything is going to have its own database and everything is going to be awesome. Um, but when we go down that path, what we... You know, we're saying this, but we have to also reconcile the fact that now we're building a distributed system, a fully, a, 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 a fully data-centric distributed system. And we need to understand some things about data in a distributed system that we didn't really have to reason about in our nice, safe world. Um, that some of, those, some of those things we have to worry about are, well, the data that we see, what, 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 can we, what do we know about the data that we see? Inside a single service, inside a monolith, for example, we're able to query data, and we know that that's the data in the database right now, right? Um, if we start breaking things up, individual services will still have that, that, that nicety. They can say, well, the, the data inside my service, that's current. I know that. But data outside my service, once I start sending it, and anybody that receives that, that data, that 
is not now anymore. That's then. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a very stark difference between how you interpret the data when you're, when you're doing data queries and manipulation and so on. Um, and you, you, you want to make very clear that when I'm seeing data after it's left the service, that is stale data. How stale? I don't know, but, it, but it's not the current data. So we, we definitely have this notion of data on the inside of a service, transactionally um, consistent, and is what the current now is. And then when we uh, expose data or send data outside of our service, that is a point in time snapshot of, of that data. And if you start to squint, you start to think, oh, this sounds like, this sounds like events. This sounds like immutable data that has left the service that if you, if you reason about it and model it properly, that we can, we can call these events, but we'll come back to that. Another thing we take for granted is that our services can just talk to each other over the network. And in some cases, we've written libraries or used frameworks that hide the fact that there's even a network. It makes it look like there's a, a nice local call. But this is not the call graph, this is not really what it looks like when we, when we make these calls over the network. It probably is something more, <laughs> worse than this. Um, but here's, here's an abstract idea of what that, what that looks like. But what we're talking about, these, these services are communicating over networks, IP packet switched networks, which are asynchronous networks. Um, the opposite of that would be a synchronous network, where everybody's on exactly the same time and we're able to send data and tr transmit data and everyone accepts that there's, there's a central point in time or, or there's, a, there's a, a, um, a shared concept of time. In a, and, and an example of that would be, I guess, maybe the, the CPU systems or the, the, uh, the chipset systems inside of our, our computers. Those are all clocked by the same CPU and everybody runs at the same rate. Um, another one might be the traditional old landline telephone where you picked up the phone, an actual direct circuit was created and a bandwidth allocated for you between you and the other end. But what we're talking about in these networks, in these, these packet switch networks, is that everyone has their own concept of time. There's, there's actually uh, uh, no guarantees at all of time between, one, between A and, and B in the system. If I start sending messages to A, that, that message could be arbitrarily delayed before it even gets to B. It could also not get to B. Or it could get to B and B responds and that gets lost. Or B thinks it's responding and, and you know, the computer itself is just dropping packets on the floor. Um, so there's no, there's no concept of time. Each individual service has its own time. So when we start to look at data that's left the, left the service, we kind of have to model this idea of, so, so here, here's another example of, of time coming into the picture. When, Data is left, it's data on the outside, and it's then, it was back then in the past. And when we have these services communicating at their own cadence and on their own concept of time, we, we, we want to we model that, and we want to take that into account um, because we don't really know, because of, because of this discrepancy with time, we don't really know when there's a failure. We don't know if things failed. We don't know if they're just taking a long time. Um, so we have to build this, these concepts and model them into the system as a first class design, uh, uh, um, you know, right, right, as a, as a first class citizen. So how do you end up reading data and updating data in this environment where uh, there's no concept of time, there's things that look like failures and there could be failures, um, and we start to see solutions that, that uh, uh, are a little bit suboptimal. So, for example, let's say we need to update a customer's address. Their address changed and they're moving, so we got to update it in the system. It's not as simple as, well, we'll just call a database and tell it to update the, the address. Because that address impacts other parts of the system. When, uh, when we move and when we change locations, that could potentially impact uh, how taxes are calculated. That could impact potentially in-flight deliveries. That could impact how we send out promotional uh, material. So we want to be able to tell other systems that the address has changed, not just update it locally and leave them on their own. Um, but this is not a very good way to do it, where we start a transaction, we update it locally, and then we close the commit the transaction, and then send off that update, right? Because what if, what if something 
what if the what if this process fails after the commit and doesn't actually send the update? So we could move it into the commit, but what if we send the update now and then fail or roll back? So now we've sent this update, but we've not actually made the change locally. So we can um, try to mitigate that. So this is more of a, a visual uh, description of what we were trying to do, where we're trying to write to multiple infrastructure services, data services. Uh, we could mitigate that with uh, some sort of coordination between the, the resources that we're using. Um, and you know, between services, between these time boundaries, between these domain boundaries, we don't want to use this inside a single domain inside a single boundary, single time boundary, this, this sort of coordination is more acceptable. But in general, having to, having to try to uh, coordinate between two systems using XA transactions or, or two-phase commit transactions um, adds a lot of management overhead. So where are we storing these transaction logs? What happens when there's deadlocks? What happens when there's heuristics and we give up? And we, it ends up becoming uh, kind of a mess. And it's difficult to manage at scale with a lot of services, and, we're, and a lot smaller services now when we're talking about microservices. Another example where, where we see something similar, where a uh, customer updated their profile, now we need to call back to backend systems and say, okay, well now let's update the recommendation engine, let's update um, other parts of you know, the, the promotional or, or relevance uh, search engines, uh, and on and on. We end up making calls to all these individual services. And that's, that's fine, but when things fail, we have to think about, well, do we need, now, now do we need to roll back some of those changes that we made? And are we properly, are we doing this with the SAGO pattern or a compensating transaction or something? Are we storing the state? Are we basically imp implementing a transaction manager in our, in our service? Um, and then what happens if we do make this compensating transaction or, or the, this compensating action? Now, it's probably, if, if you've modeled this correctly in the way you've architected your services, then it's probably just fine. But if you, if you didn't, what, what you're basically doing is writing data and then rolling it back, but somebody could have seen this data. Somebody could have made decisions based on the change that you made here that you actually decided, well, I changed my mind, I don't want to do that. And in the database world, that's called a read uncommitted change, that we're seeing data that actually wasn't meant to be seen. And we're making decisions that we're going forward. So this could have some pretty nasty effects if you're if you're not careful about uh, what what this what this uh, compensating transaction is doing. Um, another another thing that that uh, may come up, and actually we're going to skip this. We're going to come back to that. Um, another thing that that often comes up is when we start making queries out to our services, and uh, uh, we're getting return potentially unbounded lists of objects. And for each one of those objects, now we need to iterate through and call and, and do an enrich, uh, call a different service and get more data about those individual elements in the list. That's called the n, n plus one problem. Um, now the, the, the solution, or parts of the solution, I guess, that people uh, start to implement is, well, then we'll just create a bulk API to do that. We'll create a bulk API, and every service is going to end up creating a bulk API. And they all might do it a little bit differently. And then they realize, well, wait a minute. Well, we do want this bulk API, because we want to process this all at once. We don't want, it, we don't want a n plus 1. Uh, but so maybe we'll, we'll add, but we need more fine-grained um, sorting and filtering and, and exclusion um, predicates. So we'll, do, we'll write our bulk APIs with the ability to pass in some criteria for how we actually process it. Um, and then we just kind of keep doing that and adding all these uh, weird APIs on top of our bulk API. And we sort of just at one point give up and say, well, fine, just, just here's, here's a generic query. Just run it for me. And we end up basically implementing a database in a really crappy way. Another, another thing we might resort to is, uh, is caching. Um, and this makes the problem of time and uh, state very obviously, you know, we're talking about cache state, uh, so there's going to be some staleness. So it brings that into the uh, into the design, which is good. But the problem happens when things start to change behind the scenes. Now we know it, we're stale, but now we're also not able to keep up. There's no change. Uh, there's triggers that there's no tr uh, triggers on the on the downstream service to say, hey, this thing this thing's updated. You're stale beyond too long of a limit. 
So what we need is we need to be able to um, model these failures, model time as a first class citizen. We also have some expectation for data consistency. We want to make changes to our system. Um, and if we start talking about distributed systems and consistency and time and failures and all this stuff, this sounds very, very familiar. There's a, there's a, 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 a theorem out there. Who's heard of the CAP theorem? A handful of people. So, oh, a lot, a lot more. <laughs> nice, good. This is a good crowd. Um, and with, with the CAP theorem, the CAP theorem is probably a good place to start when we reason about these, these sort of struggles, but it's not, it's not an ideal way of discussing it because CAP says that we have three, three things, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance, and then we just need to pick two. That's what CAP says. And that sounds very simplistic, especially when you can't really, you can't give up partition tolerance. That's a given. We looked at our, our networks. We're asynchronous networks. There's no guarantees on time, failures, queuing, all this stuff. We can't give up partition tolerance. That's a given. So we have to pick, then, in the, in the face of partitions, we have to pick either C or A. Now, CAP defines C, consistency, <coughs> as very, very the, the most strict consistency that you can get and defines A, availability, the most availability that you can get. So far ends of what is actually a, a, a spectrum. Um, but so if we have to look at it through the lens of picking either the most extreme of either of the cases, then we're kind of doing ourselves a bit of a disservice, and we're overlooking a possible other solution. So for example, in, uh, in the cons consistency is, is really just about how, how you read back what may have happened in the past. And at the top, the most strict linearizability says when things change, you immediately see it. Everybody imme immediately will see it. And everything happened in a nice strict order, nice strict line, and that's it. There's no, there's no staleness. You take a step down, sequential consistency says, well, you still have this nice line, but you may not see it right when it happened. You may, there might be some lag. You'll see everything in the same order, but you, you might not see it right away. And you keep going down, causal consistency says, well, you may not see a perfect line, but the things that are related to each other, you'll see those in the right order. So for example, you'll see the blog post before you see the blog post comments, right? It doesn't make sense if it's the other way. So you'll see a causal relationship between events. And on and on and on, all the way down to, like uh, monotonic reads means, well, you're not going to see, you might not see all of it, but you'll see it all moving forward in time, all the way down to com eventual consistency in this, in, this, in this model is, it just could be anything. As long as it's eventually right, it could be anything when you read it. And that may or may not be good um, for the use cases you're exploring. But there's an awesome, awesome paper that I highly recommend from Doug Terry, who used to work, work at Microsoft, I think he's at Amazon now, uh, where he explains these consistency models in real life in terms of baseball, the game of baseball, and what sort of consistency models you might need if you are the scorekeeper. You might need linearizability. You, you want to know what the score is. Before, you, know, you want to know when the game ends, who wins the game, and you also want to know if the game's tied so that if you need to go into extra innings and, on, and, and so on. But you might, as a scorekeeper, you might really just need read my rights consistency. I want to see all the rights that I made. How other people see the game it really just depends on who you are. But as a scorekeeper, I might just need read my rights, not full, strict consistency. As a, as a sports writer, I might not write an article until the next day. I, I might not need the, the data in certainly not strict linearizability, maybe, maybe some uh, moving window of bounded staleness, uh, maybe eventually consistent. Um, uh, consistency model, um, down to, uh, you know, the, what was the radio one? So the radio one where, you, yeah, you might catch some of the radio updates, but you don't want to see scores or hear scores move back in time. So you just, you just, you might want monotonically increasing uh, reads of the scores so that you're, you're constantly seeing what is, is moving forward and on. So there's, the, the, the point is, cap might not be a good way to think about how to, how to reason about these, these issues. And there are different levels of consistency that you might need and the trade-offs that you'll make for uh, availability. Um, but how, do, how is, is this, uh, this is all theoret 
theoretical stuff. Now, well, how, did, how would this apply? Can we use relaxed consistency between systems? I would argue yes. I would argue that in real life, there's very, very few um, examples of things that are strictly consistent. We communicate by passing messages and alerts and events between each other, and we react and so on. There's, there's eventual consistency between uh, you know, our interactions. But how does it, what, what would this look like in, in an uh, IT system? Where if a customer made an update to their profile, and we want to share that with downstream systems, we can, instead of trying to do all kinds of two-phase, three-phase commit type protocols to get consensus across these different systems, across these boundaries where we don't really have any influence on these services that live in their own time, you know, we can use something like strict consistency or maybe causal consistency to communicate some of these updates downstream. So in this case, we're going to use a seatless, ends up being sequentially consistent log that uh, we, we constantly append data to and will eventually be seen in the right order by these systems downstream. Um, and I'll, I'll go into a couple more uh, examples, but what, we, what we've done, what we're doing by saying we'll manage the data, we'll tune the consistency models to what we need, is what we're saying is we're, we're building a distributed system, we're building a, a very data intensive system at the application layer at the application layer, where this all used to be in the infrastructure. Now, is this, is this practical? Do people do this? There are at least three, there's probably more, actually there's a lot more, but at least three examples where some of these internet companies have done exactly this. They, they modeled changes to their system as a set of events driven through a consistency model that is tuned down, much lower, to be able to scale out to be able to react to changes and make changes to their system without impacting other parts of the system. Um, and these are, these are fine. These, they they uh, open sourced a couple of these. The, the Yelp one has a big paper that, or article, a blog post that they wrote uh, about how they built out this data pipeline. Um, but if you were to start using any one of these, there's, there, there's some drawbacks to using some of these. One is they're kind of built, so for example, the Yelp one was built for Yelp. It was built for their infrastructure, it was built for their observability teams, um, it was built for my just uh, uh, being able to stream data out of MySQL, MySQL database. Um, what we want is something similar to these, built on best of breed open source technologies, built in a modular way so that we can pick and choose the pieces that we want and construct the data pipeline uh, that we want. And that's exactly what this open source project is. This open source project is called Debezium. And it is an engine, it is a change data capture engine that allows you to expose changes in your microservices to the outside world in a, in a data on the outside type of way. Where we're exposing these events to the outside world by capturing changes in the database as they happen. So we're, we're, not, try, we're not trying to do weird application level two phase commit type things when, when events happen when things change. Uh, we're not manually going in and trying to figure out how do, how do we put in triggers for this table and that table. And what we're, what we're doing is we're saying anytime the database makes a change, let's capture that and put it somewhere. And specifically, Debezium is, is meant to be a modular component, best of, uh, best of breed open source um, uh, engine that is built on top of Apache Kafka. So what we're able to do with Debezium is read the database, read the database transaction log, logs natively, and pipe that data, pipe those changes, each one of those records, into a Kafka log that consumers downstream can then read and react to, and either store data in their own systems, or interpret the data, or potentially join it with other, other stream processing technology. Um, but we're taking the database and we're turning it into a stream. Now, Debezium specifically is, and what, what, what I meant by modular and component driven and all that stuff is, Debezium is an engine that has plugins for different databases. The idea is, is the architecture is pluggable that we can uh, build new connectors for different database technologies. 
Uh, the Yelp one, for example, was just MySQL. LinkedIn one had MySQL and Postgres, but they were kind of, kind of weirdly uh, um, um, commingled. With, with Debezium, what we're, we have connectors today for MySQL, for MongoDB, Postgres, we did just merge a, a pull request for, uh, for uh, the Postgres connector about three weeks ago. Um, proceed at your, own, at your own rate. And then we'll be adding things like Oracle and, my, and Microsoft SQL and, and others. Um, but w the way it works is we're reading the database transaction logs. We, we decide which da uh, Debezium connector we want to use to capture data uh, changes from this uh, da database. And then we stream those, those tables and those changes into Kafka topics. Are there any questions about, about that? Yeah. Back there. Yes, yes. Um, so the question was, can you be very specific and configure which tables, schemas, databases, and so on that you're interested in in the, in the database? The answer is yes. You can specify uh, whitelist, blacklist, include these, don't include these. Uh, which which databases, if you're in my in the MySQL uh, lingo, um, which schema and other database lingo? Um, yeah, you can very finely control what parts of the database you cap you start to capture. Yep. Both, actually. So um, Debezium actually tracks DML changes, or sorry, DDL changes and schema changes, and keeps an in-memory representation of that schema. Because as it's reading the DMLs, um, it, it needs to know which version of the schemas go along with that change. And, yep? And there's a few where I can read on for for schema changes, because I probably have to then subscribe to a different queue to read updates for this. Yeah, exactly, this exactly. So you can, what you can do is store the different schemas out of band somewhere in a, re, in a schema registry. We do have integration with Confluence schema registry, so you use Abro in that, in that case. Um, and you can store these different schemas in the Abro schema registry, and then as producers, we, you know, you can, we can store the, the Abro schemas into the registry, and then as consumers, you pull down the ones that match the version of, of the data that you're reading. Yep. Um, so some of, the, some of the benefits of this, if you start to go back and think through some of the hardships that we would have to confront with, uh, with trying to manage connection or, or uh, uh, coordinating data changes between uh, systems, um, what we're able to do, here's an example of the cache, the cache one where we, we put a cache in front of our, our, our service, now, and the, you know, part of the problem we had with that was the data invalidation. We can use Debezium and you can use Kafka as a live stream update into our cache. So we always have a hot cache. We always have, it's still going to be somewhat stale, right? Because anytime data comes out of the service, it's, it's by definition stale. So there's going to be some, uh, some time lag, but the cache, you don't have to try to build wonky application level things for being able to do uh, cache invalidation. So now we have Debezium streaming the data changes into, into the database. Um, we can do things like when we, maybe we've separated our application out into multiple bounded contexts and we're following domain driven design patterns. And in, you know, we've decided that the orders and booking a bounded context has a domain model that's very uh, specific and tuned for being able to take orders. The administration side of the, the website where maybe we're adding, I don't know, if, if we're, if this is for books, maybe we're adding new titles or new authors or uh, updating uh, book information. Um, when we make changes to some of those books, we can automatically just go, just publish the, the part, uh, the parts, I guess, to the, to the gentleman's question back there, just the part of the data that's interesting for outside consumers. We can publish that through Debezium and Kafka and have our search service automatically pick that up and, and process that stream and maybe store that data into an Elasticsearch that's much more highly tuned for uh, querying. And we can have other services. We can build um, audit services and um, recommendation engines and all this other stuff based on the data in these streams. So now we just add new, new consumers. Um, and what you end up kind of doing is in a microservice architecture, you end up having a couple, so two, two, def two definitely two distinctly different types of services. 
services that are aligned very nicely to your bounded context. And um, the domain model is consistent. You're able to do things like order processing or search or administration or whatever. But then you're able to build these, uh, this word's kind of overloaded too, but these, these services that kind of aggregate or, or watch these data streams and build new functionality on top of aggregated data and display data in a very um, denormalized way. So what we're doing is we're, 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 kinda, we're trying to get away from when we distribute out our data across all these services and having to call each and every one of these service, services just to display something on, on a web page or a, or a cell phone. So we're calling all these services and then we're kind of trying to do joins inside our, the services making these calls and try to do it in memory for each, for each time we get invoked. I guess kind of nasty. What we're doing is we're turning that upside down and we're saying pre-compute that denormalized uh, data. Pre-compute those joins, those queries that we know we want to run. Uh, and, and have a cache, put it in Elasticsearch, put it in whatever, store it however you need. Each service has its own database so they can store it however they want. Uh, and now the queries into the system become more simplified. We're putting the joins, we're, we're turning the joins in, inside out. Um, and I do have an example of this, a much more detailed example of this on my GitHub using a project at Red Hat that we, that we typically use to demo uh, Java EE concept uh, called Ticket Monster. And if you're asking, who, does anybody use Debetium? And the answer is yes. There's, a, there's actually a lot, of, a, a lot of folks in the community, but one, one company specifically just did a case study called, uh, their, their name's, uh, name of the company is WePay, uses Debetium to build this sort of reactive event-driven um, denormalization of their data across microservices, and they have uh, a really nice write-up uh, describing exactly. So you asked about the registries, they tied it in with Confluent, um, and you know, they, 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 they explain in, in gory detail how exactly they implemented all that. So, um, so I'm kind of out of time. I was going to show a demo. We have three minutes. I uh, went a little bit long. Do you have a link to your demo? Uh, yes, I do. I absolutely do. Let's find that. Um, here. So you guys can either write it down or I'm going to tweet it right now. <laughs> you, you can write it down if you like, but otherwise I'm going to... Yep. Oh. Got it? Otherwise, I'm going to literally live tweet it right now. Yes. Devox. Yes. Demo. Deck. Okay. So back to if there's any questions, I'll be happy to take questions. I'll be here for a little bit longer afterward. Um, oh, damn. Ask questions. <laughs> Can you compare this to some uh, other solutions that are doing the same, like this page streaming, like Sybase, Easy? So, I mean, the, the idea of doing data capture in uh, the databases isn't isn't terribly new, but they've always been very rigid proprietary solutions for that. So, for example, Oracle Golden Gate has been able to do change data capture from um, from Oracle for a little while. Um, yeah. And then we've we've been able to do things like you can hack Postgres to, or in, in, in the past we had to ask, uh, hack Postgres to expose change data capture information, um, but. There's, there's, a, there's a newer way of doing it that Debezium actually implements. Who else asked a question? You asked a question back here. <coughs> Can you hand that back? <laughs> Thanks. Any other questions? I have three more books. Yeah. No. So this is just one way 
get the data out of the database. And then at that point, you can do, you can do stream processing, put it back in the database, do it however, however you want. Yeah. Does it have to use the Kafka? Repetition? No, actually, no. So the, the implementation that we envision is using Kafka, but it doesn't have to. So that, that connector, those, those, little, those little connectors for the different databases can be run in embedded mode or outside of the Kafka Connect framework. So, so you can run it outside of Kafka Connect in your, in your own applications and then stream the data into whatever, into JMS, into wherever, yeah. Yeah? All of the problems you described are inherent with this, with this system. So yeah. is there anything microservices specific about these things where it is easier or harder than if I would have built a distributed system 20 years ago when I didn't know the term microservices existed? Just pretend that the term microservices exists. <laughs> 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 How does Debesium Yeah. So, however the data becomes materialized in a cache or a database or some system downstream is kind of application specific. Um, and actually, if you squint, that this this whole idea of taking changes, taking events, and denormalizing them, make it easier to read, doing joins, pre-computing these joins is kind of the CQRS pattern, the command query responsibility separation pattern. And in CQRS, the read side of CQRS is very application specific. Now how you get the data into that application specific uh, form is going to be application specific stream processing. So you'll be reading the, the canonical, I don't want to use that term, canonical, but you'll be reading the data format and the schema format that's on the, the messaging topic and doing the transformations that you need to do to fit it into the model that's outside, that's outside of Debezium. Yep. Once it gets into Kafka, so Debezium will take changes out of the database and put it into Kafka. Once it's become a stream, it's, you, can, you can treat it however you'd like. We are at Red Hat. We have a product called JBoss Data Virtualization, which is a data federation uh, framework. And we are soon going to be using Debezium under the covers in embedded mode, like, like someone asked over here, to be able to keep a materialized views of our federated data up to date. Is there some cold start mechanism to, like, let's say, I want, no, if I started, I get data from that moment, or is there also something to say, oh, I want data starting from Monday or from the beginning of time? I want to synchronize. Yeah. Also in the past, not only the future. So with Debezium, at least specifically the MySQL connector, we are able to, when we first connect to MySQL, we're able to take a consistent snapshot. So MySQL has MVCC and all that stuff. We're able to take a consistent snapshot of the data, stream that out, and then, okay. and then catch up in the bin logs from where we're at that point in time. Yep. Yeah. Say that, say that again? Uh, how do you handle uh, uh, foreign keys? Yeah, foreign keys, that is a good question. Because um, when we start talking about um, breaking these systems up and kind of elevating some of the entities or the value objects in our, in our domain, we have to make identity very explicit. In those in those pieces, and um, we, you know, in within a single service, we can leverage the database technology and the features that it has to help enforce integrity constraints and all that stuff. But as soon as as data leaves the service and gets brought into materialized views, Elasticsearch, or however else, um, there's going to need to be a more universal way of identifying that piece of data, what or what that data represents. Um, and if you look at uh, the, again, I'll go back to the domain-driven design um, patterns and, and the, the community has uh, great, great, great patterns for how you do that identity, how you do that identity management, how do you capture that in the domain, uh, how do you associate that across different services. Um, the domain-driven design uh, explicitly, I would say, recommends using these sort of 
eventually consistent systems between boundaries, between bounded contexts. Um, and because of that, because of the, the eventually consistent nature of these systems, I mean, you're not going to have very strict invariance um, across systems when, when changes happen, unless you try to coordinate all those changes, right, with a distributed transaction or something. Well, I, I, I thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining me.